Hey everybody, this is Vicki Davis. I'm excited to be with you today and I'm so sorry that uh, the weather or the internet or something has happened, but I did want to make sure that I'm there with you even if right now I'm in Seattle and uh, getting ready to do um, some things today. So um, we're going to talk about today fantastic tools for schools in more than 50 ways to rock and I'm going to cover as many as I can in the 45 minutes that we have. But there's two things that I want to encourage you. I have a two-step simple strategy for transformational change. And step one is what I call innovate like a turtle. Now this little turtle was named by a person in Saskatchewan a couple weeks ago. We call him Kaizen. Kaizen is a Japanese term for slow, steady improvement. And this is my strategy for improving in my classroom and in my life. I always have three things. So what are my next three things? And my goal is to always move forward a little bit every day. So I take 15 minutes two to three times a week to learn something new. And as a teacher, because I finished school last week, but I do this every week even when I'm losing my mind at the end of school, um, I try to take 15 minutes just a few times a week to learn something new and to apply it and to test it out. So first is innovate like a turtle, and second is to always have your big three. What are the three things that you want to learn? So think of today like a menu. I'm going to give you lots of menu options that you can choose from, and then you're going to pick three, just three. Think of it like appetizer, main dish, dessert. You're not going to be able to fill yourself up with a lot, just like you couldn't eat all the things on a menu item. If you really like the food, then you're just going to go back to that restaurant more and pick some next time. So you may want to watch this video again and go back and pick some other things the next time. So um, these are the secrets for how I've been able to do the things I've done. I do have a blog called the Cool Cat Teacher blog and during this whole presentation you can use the conference hashtag on Twitter and I'll be answering your questions on Twitter as we go. Now if you're watching this later and this is not live, you can just do the at sign at Cool Cat Teacher and ask me questions and I always like to answer questions for fellow teachers. So I do want to ask you this question. Um, ask yourself and if you look at this picture, who is the person here who you think is the greatest innovator? Um, in this picture is the greatest innovator that I've ever known. And it may not be who you think. It's actually Miss Grace Adkins. And she taught me that innovation is not an age, it's a mindset. Now, this other young lady, she came to visit Miss Atkins and she put this on her Instagram. Uh, didn't know anything about me being there too, and that's fine because Miss Atkins uh, far dwarfs me in the um, the learning community. She's 83. She's our full-time learning lab director. She reads three to four books a week. She rides 125 miles a week on her stationary bike. And she does so many amazing things. And she is my inspiration and my mentor. Helps so many children. And what, one thing that she does is she takes home three folders of kids every weekend. She reads the folders. And on Monday morning, she calls the parents and talks to them about what um, they can do to help that child. So she's really someone I admire so much and um, I hope that you all will um, take after her and say, okay, what can I do a little bit every week? So here's the first question. How many years did it take to get to 50 million subscribers for the telephone? Well, it took 70 years. You can see here on the screen my slides are running a little fast. Um, let's talk about 50 million subscribers for the radio. And we have people like Orson Welles, and we have lots of other radio folks. Uh, my husband loves Red Skelton. Um, 38 years to get to 50 million subscribers. And now we have the television and lots of the shows that we love here. And I wonder how many years it took to get to 50 million for television. Well, it took 13 years. So you see that the time is compressing here. And now, what about... The internet. How long did that take? That just took four years. So you can see that things are moving much faster. It's not just an illusion. It's true. So how about this little fellow? Raise your hand if you have played Angry Birds Star Wars uh, like a lot of us. This little fellow took 35 days. So this word of mouth just transmitting and telling things. Um, so how can we keep up? Well, the first thing to realize is that this is happening because we trust other people. We don't really trust companies anymore. So when you talk to somebody in the hall and they say, hey, I want to do this or I want to do that, 
you are um, having this word of mouth thing that happens now. And in fact, if you're a millennial, uh, and you can kind of point at the millennials beside you, um, the millennials, if you study them, they actually have found that this generation believes it is their responsibility to tell the rest of us the things that we need to use in their life, in our lives. So they kind of think it's their job to vet things and find them out for, for the rest of us who are not millennials. Um, so we want to embed our learning 15 minutes, two to three times a week. Now, Twitter is one great way to learn. It's one of my favorite ways. And a lot of people say, well, how can you keep up? Well, here's the point. You don't. So we have this lovely river by our house called the Flint River. Um, and But if I went to the Flint, I might drink on it. Actually, it's pretty clean nowadays. It used to not be. But I might take a sip or I might, you know, um, raft or I might canoe or I might go fishing. But I would not dream of sitting at that river and trying to drink it. Why would I do that? I couldn't do it. I cannot take in that whole river because I'm just me. I'm just one person. So I'm going to use that river as I see fit for my life. So you want to do the same thing. When you go to Twitter, you're going to find something here you might want to use. You might want to use something over here or, oh, I'm going to try this or that. So just like the menu approach, you can't eat the whole menu. You can't drink the whole river. You're just going to take little pieces to improve a little bit. So boom, I bet you've never had this happen before, but your keynote has just changed clothes. Uh, and let's keep going. So there are very five very popular ebook readers. Now you're going to notice in the top right hand corner here, I have the word reinventing paper. Now a lot of this is coming from my book Reinventing Writing, where I talk about all the ways that writing has been reinvented. Now the five most popular ebook readers are Kindle, iBook, Nook, Kobo, and Google Play Books. Now why is this important? First thing assignment that my my daughter had to do when she went to Georgia Tech was she had to download an ebook by a professor um, in, onto her iPad. Now students should know how to open ebooks, how to search ebooks, how to annotate ebooks. I do have this epic ebook guide at the bottom here that you can go to to learn all about how to use ebooks. But ebook fluency and this type of fluency is just very important. The term we use is trans literacy. So it's literacy across multiple media. We know our students are pretty literate in opening a book and finding the page number. Well, are they literate in finding a location number or finding a term in a book or downloading a book and putting it on their ebook reader? Now, there are 10 places that I love to find, download, and read free or inexpensive ebooks. Um, we've got Project Gutenberg, a free booksy, bookish. I love Goodreads. Goodreads is like a social network for readers. And us teachers, so many of us get very active at Goodreads over the summer because we're sharing and talking about books. Um, I read from Brian Tracy that all you have to do to be in the top 10% of your field is to read about an hour a day. And that's very true. I've um, been doing that now for about 10 years. It makes a real difference. So do take time to read every day. Which book helps you kind of figure out which book you should read next? You tell it what you like and it tells you other ones. Now, eReader IQ is cool because it'll watch favorite authors just like some of these others will as well. You've got BookBub, which is another one a lot of us use to give tell us that, you know, there's a discount on a David Baldacci book or whatever. A hundred zeros is uh, another site. What should I read next? And then I want to mention Calibre. Calibre is the Swiss Army knife of ebook tools because what it does is it will let you take one format, say a Moby, for example, and it'll let you turn it into another format. So one thing that happens sometimes to teachers is we find, say, the complete book works of William Shakespeare, and it's in this format, and we need to turn it into another format so that our students can open it in their book reader, whatever tool they're using. And so Calibre will convert every way that you could imagine. Literature teachers, you can have access to so many things, the complete works of William Shakespeare, all of these things, particularly older authors, you can get for free. Uh, I know I bought the complete works of Mark Twain for 99 cents and almost felt wrong because he's such a great uh, writer, in my opinion. Uh, but you can have these resources, and it opens up all kinds of possibilities for you in your classes. Um, there are many ways to publish ebooks. I love this first one, Liberio, lets you write it in a Google Doc and then you export it to an ebook. So you can have all of your students writing together. 
you could have them do their portfolio for the year and put it all in Liberia, I mean, into Google Drive, and then boom, turn it into an ebook uh, to share with others. Draft is another online tool that lets you edit. Of course, you've got iBooks Author, but just remember there's special licensing things that happen with iBooks Author that don't happen with others. For example, you can't take it from iBooks Author and then turn around and put it on Amazon because of the way the licensing works. So I've kind of stayed away from that myself. You've got uh, LeanPub. You've also got Book Creator on the iPad. So add that one to your list as well if you're using iPads. You, a lot of people are using uh, PowerPoint and Keynote now. And my favorite way to do eBooks is actually Scrivener. That's the tool I use for everything. If you're a writer or if you're doing um, a thesis or anything long, Definitely want to take a look at that. If you're a blogger, look at how Michael Hyatt uses Scrivener because that's my method of using Scrivener as well. Now, note-taking has been reinvented. It's important to realize that um, digital note-taking is not ideal for everything. Math and science in particular, the research is showing that you should have that process of using a pen. So, um, some people call it digital inking when you write with a pen on a digital device. And I've heard a lot of good things about the Surface 3 in digital inking. I haven't had a lot of luck with my iPad in digital inking. But my favorite notebook is Evernote for me personally. But the best collaborative notebook is OneNote. Um, they have this new thing called OneNote Classroom that's incredible. It lets you create um, notebooks for the school and talk about a great formative assessment tool. Being able to see kids as they take their notes and what's going into their notes really kind of helps you see what they're picking up because note-taking is so important. Now, if you want to know how I teach note-taking, if you go to youtube.com forward slash coolcatteacher, there's a whole lesson where I teach the Cornell note-taking system and how I have students take notes for my in-flip method of teaching. So students actually watch the videos in class and they do have to take notes. And I have found that note-taking is a very important part of retention. And I actually look at the notes and make sure they got everything that they need to, to get. Google Keep is another one. They did have Google Notebook. They got rid of it. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. And then I use paper. Um, in fact, I have a, a paper notebook here, and I'll take the stuff out of that, take a picture. It goes into Evernote. And then I use this really cool tool called Task Clone, T-A-S-K, Clone. And it will actually, those little boxes you put in Evernote, it'll take it out of that and it'll put it in my list service, which is called Wonderlist. And for you geeky people, you understand that. And those of you who are beginners, you can just ignore what I just said. Um, so again, OneNote is the only collaborative notebook service. Um, this is how it used when I, I kind of first tested it with my students. And I'm planning on moving back into OneNote in uh, the classroom for my classes this year to make things easier. Now, note cards have been reinvented. We call it social bookmarking, but I just like to call it digital note cards. Now, my favorite is Digo. Delicious is kind of going by the wayside because Yahoo hasn't really invested in it, but Digo is awesome. So let's look at how this works. Um, if you um, look here, let me get my little pen here. If you look here, you can see a note card that I used when I was uh, doing my book, uh, Reinventing Writing. And... Um, all of the arrows point to things that are part of um, a, a note card that are still here. This is a Digo um, note card here. So um, the hyperlink is actually part of the bookmark. So that's already there. You don't have to write that big, long hyperlink. The title goes in here automatically. Um, now, right here, um, you want to type in what it is you want to type. I have found that if you can get students to edit right at this point when they're looking at a document or whatever, then they were, are much less likely to plagiarize. So I actually look at what I call these digital note cards that have to make sure that students are editing and, and not just copying because anything you copy on that page pops right into here into the note card. So you want to be real careful. If I see students just copying a whole web page, I'll say, uh, uh I'm not taking that. You've got to go back and edit this. Now, one thing I just want to point out is if you're using note cards for documentation, say a student has something inappropriate on a web page, you want to check this little button cache because that's actually going to take a snap of that picture and put it into Digo for you. Now, you've got tags. Tags are new. This is something you couldn't do before. And um, I like to use social bookmarking groups. Um, you can have kids under 13 on Digo. You just need to set it up on the teacher side and not have students to join Digo on the main page. 
So from that comes the group dictionary. So this group has this group dictionary. And I've shared it. I have an educators group on Digo. You could also make lists. You can do all kinds of things um, with this. But you see that you have a lot more features on a digital note card. It's a lot easier to do. So this is kind of how I do a lot of my, of my research uh, as well. And let me go here. Okay, so the most popular cloud syncing services, if you think about it, your filing cabinet has been reinvented. So now we have Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive. I've kind of realized that everything in my filing cabinet, I'm not really using it anymore. Um, so I started scanning it. I have this awesome scanner called a ScanSnap. So I scan everything and put it into my computer, into Evernote or wherever it needs to go. And I'm just kind of getting, slowly getting rid of that paper in I'm just not using my filing cabinet because it's so much easier to find things on my computer. So it is good to pick one of these or multiple. I actually use all three, but be careful. You don't want to install Dropbox and Google Drive on the same computer on the install version. You probably want to use it from the web and just have one. So I actually put all of my documents into Dropbox. And right now I'm recording this on a new Mac, but I have a Surface. I have all kinds of other... Chromebook. I want to be able to access everything on every device I use just because it just makes it easier and it just goes between everything. So pretty much everything I use goes into Dropbox uh, to make that happen. Now, something I've really gotten into is programming with my students and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But kids love video game programming. It's a great way to get them kind of looking at uh, programming in a different way and have fun at the same time. So there's all kinds of different tools that you can use. Um, I've got this um, right here is, oops, let me go back. thought I had my pen here. Um, let me get my pen. Right here I've got a link to a, a piece I wrote for Edutopia that I just updated uh, a couple months ago of 15 ways to teach any age to code. So you want to look at that and you can look at all the ideas because I think every school should be teaching coding. If you look at the United Kingdom, they're teaching every kid age five and up how to code. And it's really unacceptable to think that um, with all the resources available that we can't put this into our curriculum somewhere. Um, there's a great tool called GameStar Mechanic. There's Game Maker, Codable, Hopscotch. These are all tools, but then don't forget Tinker has so many great things. You can also look up Hour of Code and there's lots of great resources for that. So do make time for some video game programming. Lots of cool things that are out there uh, that are awesome. Now, one thing to look for, you're going to start seeing a lot more of these, is these things called simulation environments. Now, my students participate in the Arab-Israeli conflict simulation out of the University of Michigan. And it's the best way to teach current events that I've ever found. Um, so this is what we use, um, but there are other simulations. It is where kids are playing roles and they're interacting with each other. It's very, very powerful. I particularly like things where you're playing another player because you have to learn it so deeply. So do consider and try to find simulation environments. Now, one big thing I've written a lot about lately is formative assessment. You should know what students know before they ever take the test. Um, I started uh, off by trying uh, Socrative. I also love Kahoot. But I started off trying Socrative, uh, teaching my hardest thing of the whole year, which is this thing called binary numbers. And some of you have probably heard of that. I have to teach binary addition. I have to teach binary conversion. So we convert binary to like how many gigabytes is this. So it's ones and zeros. It can be tricky. Um, so what I did is usually this, this unit takes five days. So after 15 minutes of teaching how I was teaching on the board, an interactive activity, and we had gotten up and gotten moving, so I'd gotten our body, bodily kinesthetic learners learning, we sat back down, and two kids were assistant. Miss Vicky, we know everything. We need to move ahead. And I was like, well, I'm not sure. Oh, we all know it. Everybody else is nodding their head. Yes. Well, I said, okay, well, let's go into Socrative. Everybody go in, you know, type in our classroom number. I'm writing this problem on the board. Type in your answer. Well, guess what? Only two knew the answer. <laughs> the two who were loud, everybody else just wanted the pain to end because they didn't think they could do it. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but 
I live with that. That's what kids do. They, there's some kids who think they're going to get by without learning. And I expect uh, every student to learn. And once they know that I'm going to hold them accountable, that they all will learn it, then they start learning it a little bit better and engaging. Because, you know, it takes a lot of effort to learn. And if they're using up all that cognitive energy on a crisis or drama or whatever they have in their life, sometimes it really takes some convincing to get them to be able to put forth that effort in your classroom. So I found out that a lot more of them didn't know it. We moved ahead. I did about 10, 15 more minutes, some other activities. Then a little over half the class knew it. Um, and by the end of the day, everybody knew it. And believe it or not, that five-day unit, I was able to do it in three um, because I actually knew what students knew instead of waiting till they took the test. So Socrative is awesome. Kahoot is awesome. Definitely consider that. Now, a technique that I'm really into now is called the in-flip method of teaching. Now, flip classroom is great if everybody has internet access, if everybody has a working device, and if everybody has parents to make sure they will do the homework, but we know that's not the case. So the in-flip method is in class, students are watching videos. So anything that I do as a tutorial, kind of like I'm doing with you now, um, I will record that way. And then it's kind of like I've cloned myself. So I, myself, my personal self is walking around in the classroom and my students are watching a video of me uh, in Haiku Learning, which is the platform that we use. Now my favorite screencasting tool is Office Mix. This is only on the PC. If you're on the Mac, I suggest you use ScreenFlow, which is also a very good tool. But Office Mix plugs right into PowerPoint. You can export those PowerPoint files um, as movie files. Now here's the thing that's awesome about Office Mix. So say you have 15 slides and something on slide number three changes. You don't have to re-record that whole movie again. What you do is you go on that one slide, you change that one slide, you re-record your audio, and then boom, it makes the movie again. So if you have a PC, you want to download the free Office Mix for PowerPoint, that's what you want to use for your screencasting. It's an incredible, great tool. The other thing I want to mention is if you're going to use the input method of teaching, make sure that you are consistent in how you show things on the screen for your students because you have bricks, which is the face-to-face -face classroom, and you have clicks, which is the online classroom. And you want to make sure, just like in your face-to-face -face classroom, you would never move your inbox for papers around every day. You wouldn't dream of doing that because if you're a Harry Wong fan like I am and you know classroom management is the number one thing for improving student learning, improve your classroom management, you're going to improve student learning, that you have to have constant classroom procedures. So the same thing is for your clicks, or your online classroom. You have to have constant classroom procedures. So what I do is I have the title at the top, I have the assignments on the right, I have my essential questions, and then I have a video. Now I put my videos to YouTube, we've unblocked it at our school, and I use something called a custom thumbnail so that the um, title will appear, boom, right on the very front of, of that. So one note on assignment, do spell out the location for turning work in. So you have your bricks, which is your face-to-face, -face, and your clicks, which is online. So you'll You'll notice here that I have um, turned these in in haiku. So these all say haiku. But if I want to turn it in online, I'll actually put in parentheses folder. And that will tell students they have to turn it in in the face-to-face -face classroom. Um, OK, so here we go. Now this is what I'm using for mobile app development. We're sitting about uh, two weeks out, I hope, from approval. Uh, we did a Shark Tank activity. And uh, we, we didn't have enough money to put in every app up online. So we had enough money for one, and then we were able to find money for two. So the ones that were selected were this app, Drone Zone, and then this other app called iCare are going live on the Apple and the Google Play Store here shortly. And Chrysarence is a great tool. I've seen kids as young as third grade use it. It is something you have to subscribe for. But if you want to get into mobile app development, it's, I highly recommend uh, Chrysarence as the tool of choice. Now, one thing I want to mention here, uh, and we're kind of jumping back to a conversation we had earlier. Um, some of you may get concerned that when you um, use a particular tool that you're kind of stuck there. Okay, so say 
your school is on SharePoint and they decide to move to Google Drive. Well, how are you going to move that stuff over? There's actually a tool called Mover.io that will move your files from one place to another. So you can move them every direction you want and this tool will handle it. So this is just a nice little, another little Swiss Army knife tool that I like to mention. And your third Swiss Army knife tool that I'm going to mention for you today is actually called Zamzar. Zamzar will convert pretty much every format to something else. So I don't know if you've ever had a kid come in and they say, I typed this at home, and they hand you their little jump drive, and they're all so pitiful, and they say, but I can't open it here. So what you do is you go and you put it in your computer. Hopefully you have a virus scanner. You go on to Zamzar, and you upload that file, and you say, okay, I want to convert it to Microsoft Word. Okay, Microsoft Word is DOCX format. So I'm going to convert this to DOCX format. Boom, it converts. I download it, and I put it back on the jump drive, and the child can open it on the computer into Microsoft Word. So it's a great another Swiss Army knife tool that lets you convert. Now some of you want to use Twitter in the classroom but you know that there you will not be allowed to do that. Well, one of my favorite sites is classtools.net by Russell Tarr from France and he and our Twitter buddies and converse back and forth and he's actually a classroom teacher. He does this as a hobby. One of his tools that's on this site is called Twister. So you go on here, you plug in the username, so you kind of make a believable nickname, like Emily Dickinson here, somebody did Poetry Princess for her. You have to put their real name in, you have to spell it correctly. Because when you put in the real name, uh, Russell has put in a whole database of real pictures of these folks. So you can see the real picture of Emily Dickinson is going to pop in here uh, for her real name. And then you write your tweet and put the date and make sure it's historically accurate. And then over here, you can see what was generated. So this is a great way to use Twitter without having access to Twitter. And um, a fantastic way to have people study authors. You've got historical figures in there. You've got all kinds of things in there. You could even do scientific elements. There's all kinds of fun things. Also, one thing I want to mention is you, they've got, um, he's got a fake book on classtools.net as well as many, many other things. So let's say you're going to get into blogging. Um, blogging is so important, but you know, the, the good, the amazing part of blogging is the comments and the interaction you get with the others and the global audience. We know that an audience improves student writing. We know that. They don't want to write for the wastebasket. They want to write for the world. So quad blogging is a fantastic way to do that. They've set it up now where you can sign up any time during the year. So do check out quad blogging. And what that does is so for a four-week period, you'll have three other classrooms that work with yours. And say the first week, everybody comments on classroom number one. And the second week, everybody comments on class two. The third week, everybody comments on class three. And the fourth week, everybody comments on class four. So all of your students have a week where they have some real interaction with another classroom, and then they're interacting on the other blogs and seeing other student writing for the other three weeks. It's a fantastic way to really get kids engaged. So one other tool I wanted to mention is the wiki. The wiki is a very important tool. Um, in group writing and it's something that's totally new there's really no corresponding thing of we used to have this and now we have a wiki wikis are truly new and I think it's very important before kids graduate from high school they must know how to write and collaborate on a wiki how to solve a wiki war because you can't edit simultaneously on a wiki like you can on Google Docs also, do they know how to cite their sources, how to embed, and use the discussion tab? So wikis are a very important tool that kids need to know how to use. So the three places that kids can go for wikis is Wikispaces, PBWiki, and Install Media Wiki, and use that as well. Now, Google Sites was actually built off of a wiki platform, but it is not truly a wiki anymore. So I don't really count that as, as wiki. Now, one thing my students do is I have them build a personal website. And this is my ninth and my 10th grade students. So they're age 15 and up. They don't use their full name, but they build a personal ePortfolio. Now, if you want to know more about ePortfolio in the research, just go to Edutopia, type in ePortfolio, and you can type in Vicki Davis. I just had a piece that went up just a couple weeks ago about ePortfolios. You've got Weebly, Wix, Webs, and Google Sites. And this is where kids can go and create their own 
website, their own web page, and they can do it with others too. So fantastic ways that they can create websites. Now, one thing to remember though, that if students are writing together, they also need to be doing pre-writing together. Um, and if they're planning or doing a project like an app, and this is a brainstorming um, mind map for the Westwood app that some of my students pitched and proposed a couple weeks ago, and they actually went on MindMeister and planned out all the parts of the app before they even started. So remember that pre-writing is essential, very important. Now here's a great tool, uh, Glogster, and uh, Susan Ox Nevad uh, made this Glogster all about Google Docs. I had her on my show, Every Classroom Matters, not too long ago, and she's really an incredible person you want to follow. But um, Glogster is another great way to kind of have a digital portfolio. It's very visual. Kids can put things they created from the whole year. It's beautiful, and kids love Glogster. Um, my favorite graphic design tool, though, is now Canva, C-A-N-V-A. Now, I used to be a big Photoshop fan, and the graphic you see up here, which was an infographic that uh, one of my students created about everything we did in April 2014, um, I used to create all that in Photoshop and some of those real fancy files, but now you can do all this in Canva, and it's just a snap, very easy to use, free. There are some pay for graphics in there, but if you just set up your students not to use those, you're in good shape. Love Canva. Highly recommend it. Um, here's another tool. This is called Spelling City, and you elementary teachers will really like this, and a lot of you probably already know about Spelling City and, and Vocabulary City. Um, you can actually set up the reading lists and or spelling lists, and kids can practice here. And I love it because um, my youngest has dyslexia, so it's very hard for him to learn new terminology and learn spelling. Um, and it's always going to be hard for him, but they had some games um, where they would take away letters or um, put in letters and things that really help kids, particularly those with dyslexia, um, to succeed in spelling. So we were able to get a spelling out of this site, so I swear by it, it's a great site. Now another fun one for younger kids is Fun Brain. Anytime I have a, a group of kids um, that are in there that are younger and maybe we run out of you know the activity we finish early which doesn't usually happen but say it does then we would go to fun brain there's math baseball this is the site I used with my kids to help them learn their math facts now I love VisiWords VisiWords is a blast of a site particularly for wordsmiths um, when I'm writing my fiction or when we're brainstorming you know the name is everything so we're trying to come up with a name for a new app and we'll go and we'll type in the word here and then all of this this kind of explosion happens on the screen and you can see uh, the nouns and the verbs and the adjectives and adverbs that are related and they're color coded it's a great way to teach parts of speech but then you can see all the related words and it's just a fantastic way to help kids think and use more creativity in their writing but also their brainstorming if you've got them doing projects so now I'm about to show you a quick trick that is awesome so I did a survey of my students, all the students in the whole school from our principal to figure out what kind of tools are they using. So I had them fill out this survey in Google Forms. Okay, so step one is you go into Google Forms and you have you create a survey. And the step two is that, that goes into the Google spreadsheet. Now I did an end of the year anonymous survey of my students. So I'm actually analyzing the results this way too. So what I'm going to do is this column D here, I copied everything out of that column and then I pasted it into Word and turned everything into lowercase. Okay, so everything into lowercase just makes life easier, um, especially if you have open response. You want it all to be the same, so I put it all into lowercase. And then I threw that into Wordle.net, okay, paste in a bunch of text. And then it created this cute graphic, or this amazing graphic, actually. So I was able to take this graphic and put it on the bottom of a memo and say, make the case for us going to a Bring Your Own Device, or BYOD program, because so many of our kids have cell phones. Now, I know that the cell phones have been in the press a lot lately because of the schools in England. They took away from the cell phones from the students, and they saw their test scores go up. And I would argue that is because the cell phones are not being used to teach. The cell phones are being used to distract. And if, for example, if I had a beeping noise in the side of the room 
and it was just beeping and beeping and beeping then and I took it out of the room my test scores would probably go up because I eliminated the distraction so somebody could say we have eliminated noise from the classroom and found the test scores went up <laughs> well no you didn't eliminate noise you can use noise to teach what you did is you eliminated distraction. So we have to keep things in perspective and understand that every tool just about can be used for good or for not. So I think if a teacher is not using the cell phone for good, cell phone should be off, the cell phone should be up, period, end of story. But I also think that um, resources are scarce and we don't have enough money to have everything we want. So cell phones can be used in a very positive way. So you can also do the same trick with Wikisource. Now Wikisource has all kinds of famous speeches and you take that and you can paste it into Wordle or I'm going to use Taxedo for this example. And so I take it, I paste it into Taxedo and this is the previous chart that I just showed you. But what if I take uh, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and put it in and then I put it in the face of Lincoln, Lincoln and I pull it up on my board and we start discussing. So this concept is very similar to that of front-loading the words. And those of you um, have probably had a class that talked about the importance of front-loading the words. When we tell kids ahead of time the words or we put them on a word wall or we share them with the kids, then they know what to look for when, and they'll recognize it when it's mentioned. Um, so it just, it's just a form of repetition. So this is a fantastic way to analyze speeches or could you paste in the whole first chapter of A Tale of Two Cities and look at repetition there to see what is this going to be about. Fantastic ways are, are word, word um, clouds are just wonderful. Now, another great site that tons of teachers are going on is Edmodo. Edmodo is fantastic because you can do assignments, you can do blogging, and they have these things called libraries. There are so many teacher libraries in Edmodo. It's such a fantastic tool and uh, one that I highly recommend. Now, here you can see I gave an assignment and the kids turned it in. You know, I have moved to Haiku Learning now, but Edmodo is fantastic, particularly if you're going to want to collaborate with kids in other parts of the world. Now, one of my favorite tools for managing Genius Hour, and I also used it to manage the um, app development. Now, the challenge happens when you start having kids do all different kinds of things, like happens in Genius Hour. How do you know who's doing what? And how do you keep up with it? Um, so Trello is built off of something called Agile Software Development, or Kanban, K-A-N-B-A-N. This is a tool highly used by software developers. And so here's what I had the kids do. I have them, I know this looks confusing, but um, the cool thing is I can actually filter by each child so I can see just what kids are doing. So I had them set goals by month, and then when they were done, they moved them to done, and when they were able to communicate back and forth, you can also see that I have notifications up here at the top. And that means somebody has asked me a question and I can answer the question. So it's just a fantastically efficient way to run a classroom, particularly if you have Genius Hour or if you're going to do app development or anything where you have kids doing slightly different things. So here you can see that I filtered for just Alexandra and I can see just her work that she's done, which is so convenient. Now, one thing I want to encourage you is to build your circle of the wise. So I've already talked about innovating like a turtle and having your next three things. But who are the people you're going to pay attention to? Because you become like the people that you think about the most. The, pay, the places you go impact you greatly. The books you read and the habits that you have, you choose to have in your life. These are the things that really shape who you are. So you want to intentionally pick people who are excellent, who are amazing, to be part of that circle of the wise. Now, I live in a tiny town of 5,000 people in shrinking. Uh, we'll probably be below 4,000 for the first time in, since 1950 coming up uh, when we take a census again. So I have to expand my circle of the wise to not just be the person who's going to be hanging out at the gas station, who may not be a wise person anyway, um, to people that are online and people that, that are in this world. So you can do this by with RSS. RSS is a very helpful tool, um, and, and I love it um, as a way to keep up. So I use Flipboard, I use Feedly, I use all of these tools. And what I had just shown you was actually 
a Google search on Google News, and at the bottom it said RSS. So this is a little secret place that the RSS hides. Um, that'll help you out. Okay, everybody, I'm going to go in turbo mode now because I just paused the recording and I see I have five minutes left. So let's go quickly through the rest of these. Um, MentorMob is a fantastic way to find free resources for your smart board, whiteboard, interactive whiteboard, all kinds of tools there. Go there, find teachers, great things that are happening there. Listly is another great place. You can find lots of lists. You can make lists. You can even vote these up. That's what I like about Listly is you can use them for voting on different things. Um, whether you have your community voting on the best commercial or whatever you're doing, Listly is a fantastic tool for that. Now, if you're using Flip Classroom or even if you're just sharing tutorials, ed.ted is a great way to do that. You can embed quizzes, you can see interactions, you can see what kids have done, and you can even remix what they already have there. So it's a great way to use uh, the TED um, resources. Now, Selly and Remind, two very popular ways to remind parents of things and get that on their cell phones. If you have older kids, you probably want to get them to sign up as well. Now, how do you keep up with apps? I use App Advice and Apps Gone Free. For Droid, I just go to Richard Burns' site. I don't have a Droid, and everybody I know swears by what he shares. But App Advice and Apps Gone Free are good ways to find all about the current new apps. Feedly is my replacement for Google Reader. I mentioned it earlier. It uses RSS, and this is what I use most of the time when I have my little um, turtle time, I guess I'm going to call it, um, to kind of move myself forward. Um, Feedly is where I go for that. Now, NetVibes and PageFlex can also be used, and I write about in the book, Flattening Classrooms, Engaging Minds, how you can use these tools to create something called a classroom monitoring portal. When your students have things public, you shouldn't have to guess or have those emailed to you. You should just monitor over RSS and make it easy. Now, my personal newspaper is Flipboard. You can also edit your own magazines at editor.flipboard.com. If you are a one-to-one -one iPad, every single teacher should make a Flipboard magazine, or a school should have a Flipboard magazine to share that nonfiction text that's so, so important for all the kids to be able to share and to read. Great tool. I also have a magazine. You can follow me there on that. Now, you become like those you're around. So what are you reading on your Kindle? Also, I use iCatcher as my pod catching program. You can use the podcasts on your iPhone or your iPad, but the podcast tool is just not as good as what I call iCatcher, or the name of it is iCatcher. Now, I have a show, Every Classroom Matters, but internet podcasting is huge for education. You've probably heard of the show Serial. A lot of people have been talking about well, the, the whole movement to podcast and to share things is just huge, and um, you can uh, look for my show on iTunes, but you don't have to have iTunes, and you don't even have to have an iPod to be able to listen to a podcast. Uh, that's a common misconception. Now, as a lot of you are trying to get fit this summer, I wanted to mention Couch to 5K and the Weight Watchers app, great tools to help with um, weight. And now, one of my favorite tools for building habits is called the 3030 app. And you can see on the right-hand side my Arrive at School routine. And I do this until I program myself and I know everything that I need to do. And now I don't have to use it as much. But if I'm trying to add a new element to my routine, for example, I may have to do something different on my lunch count or I may have something different I have to do, I'll add it and I'll leave my iPad or my iPhone up on my desk, roll through this, and it helps coach me through building those essential habits that you need to have. Now, Hootsuite is great for scheduling. I also use Buffer. I also use an app called Commune.it, which helps me figure out who to follow and such on Twitter. So if you really get into Twitter, you may be interested in all of those. But if you just need a basic tool, I love Hootsuite. So ePortfolios, I've already mentioned earlier, lots of great ways to do them. Weebly Webs, Wix, Wikispaces, you can also have a blog on WordPress. VoiceThread is what I recommend for younger students. And then the other thing to consider is put it in a PowerPoint or create graphics and burn a DVD of this material. So many great things are deleted in the summer times and kids lose those forever. So do make sure they have a copy. Of course, we got to mention Rubistar, great old one, but still a goodie. Use it all the time. Just don't make your rubric so confusing. Now, a great one for annual staff, you've got Smug mug and you do want to have this little disclaimer in your manual or have parents sign it but you can take all those graphics that you've these photos and you can turn them into money people can put them on mugs they can put them on calendars they can put them anywhere they want and you can make money 
uh, off of those photos that you take to help fund your annual or whatever project you're doing. Now, a free painting software is GetPaint.net, very cool one for the PC, some of you may be interested in. If you're doing any kind of recording, Audacity is still a very big one. I actually use this to record my show, Every Classroom Matters, um, and it's free. Great tool. Um, now, Stellarium is awesome. It is a free open source um, uh, uh, astronomy software program, but You've also got Microsoft Worldwide Telescope, and they hired all of these astronomers to be part of this particular tool, and it's very, very accurate. In fact, it's crazy accurate. So you want to download, use this for free if you're studying the planets in space, and it can just really turn your smart board or interactive whiteboard into an amazing experience. But you can also take it, and you can project it on the ceiling, and you can make your own planetarium for less than $500. Great thing. This top part is a little cardboard here, and you've got those little clip things that you use. Great project for parents or wood shop or for whoever you have to build a planetarium. Planetarium. Remember, kids do need help do with citations. You've got Sun at Citation Machine, Noodle Bib, Easy Bib. You've got citation generators in Microsoft Word. Now, a full, a, a, a cool one for Google, uh, for those of you who love books, is Google Ingram Viewer. This actually lets you type in words and it shows you the number of times that word occurs in all of the published books that they've indexed over a period of time. So you can see here that class size became a big conversation in the 70s and then it dropped down and now it's coming up again. Find it fascinating all the different things that are happening. Um, so use this as you research trends, history, all kinds of things. Uh, fantastic little tool there. Wolfram Alpha is for those of you in math. You can actually type in the math formula. It'll solve the formula for the kids and show them step by step what to do. If you don't know how to solve homework, you should use Wolfram Alpha, but it has incredible things for all kinds of sciences. Every kid should know how to use Wolfram Alpha. Math teachers, don't be afraid of it. Um, use it to help and coach kids in how to use Wolfram Alpha. If you need help setting appointments, Time Bridge and Doodle will help you coordinate a million people and set those appointments for you. Live Binders is another great one if you have lots of websites you want to put together. When I create a lot of study materials, I'll put things together and email these to parents because they find it's very easy to do. Now, some new favorites of mine. Wonderlist, I mentioned earlier, is my task manager. Task Clone takes those cute little boxes out of Evernote and sends it to my Wonderlist. Extensity. Extensity is the tool if you have Google Chrome that you should definitely use because it lets you turn off and on your Chrome extensions. You don't want to have too many extensions running or it'll slow you down. This is a great tool. Snagit is for grabbing screenshots and then LastPass is for remembering all those passwords. I can't believe it. I've been using LastPass about a year and I have over a hundred usernames and passwords stored. No wonder I kept forgetting it. Um, my goodness, why did I expect myself to be able to remember all that? That's crazy. Um, I love Kahoot. Plickers is another great one, especially if you don't have any um, hardly any internet at all, any technology, uh, fantastic tool. Richard Byrne talks a lot about Plickers. Telegami is a really cool tool for the iPad that lets you give little virtual tours. Um, ThingLink is another one, particularly for special ed kids that a lot of people recommend that lets you have a picture and put little links on the picture to explain things. And um, I already mentioned, this is an example from classtools.net, a fake book. Awesome tool. Kids love it. If you're studying history, if you're studying lit, definitely want to use that. Um, you can also make quizzes and arcade games out of classtools.net, so I want to recommend that. I don't have time to talk about that. We've talked about mind maps, and bubble.s is another example of a mind map. So here we go. We're going to finish up. I know I've probably overwhelmed you. This is a lot to cover. But I just want you to remember, there are only two steps to transformational change. You can't drink a river. You can't eat every item on the menu. But you can innovate like a turtle a little bit of time every day. Have your turtle time. Move ahead just a little bit. And then have your big three. What are the next three things you're going to learn? So I just encourage you now to go into Twitter, share your big three. What are the next three things you want to learn? And um, move ahead and innovate. I hope you have an awesome conference. And take good notes because, you know, you're going to come out of it with your big three. Just three. That's what changes everything.
but then you're going to want to come back to it to look, look at more of the menu items that you think will work in your classroom. Good luck, and I want you to remember this. You know what? It's all about the students. Don't get so lost in the technology that you forget. It's about those kids. Those kids need love. They need somebody to listen. They need encouragement. They need to know that you care. They need you to look them in the eye every single day. Um, call them by name and know that they're important. And then all of this other stuff will come too. Thanks for listening. Connect with me on Twitter. It's been great to be with you today. I have two books, Reinventing Writing and Flattening Classrooms, Engaging Minds, and a show called Every Classroom Matters. And you can also go to my blog at coolcatteacher.com. Thanks for letting me be with you today.